secret I'll tell you to make it a small fortune in be is you start with a big fortune. Because very often uh, people go into this kind of business without a clear idea of what are the economics going to work like. You've got a great idea about what you want to cook, what you want to sell, but making money on it is a completely different kettle of fish. I'm Sin Pugat. I've been in Singapore since uh, 1999. One of my favorite dishes apart from fried chicken is laksa, as you maybe see on my shirt. I can never eat laksa without spilling on my shirt, and I had laksa for lunch today. Um, I'm going to talk to you about my journey with Four Fingers, but we're going to start with when I came to Singapore in 1999. Uh, McDonald's sent me down to be the regional marketing director. McDonald's, as you may know, is quite a big brand worldwide. And my entire career has been working with brands, starting with Disney back in the, in the 90s, and McDonald's, and later on Burger King. I moved to Les Amis, which some of you may know is a Michelin star restaurant group in Singapore. I later then joined Baskin Robbins Coffee Bean Tea Leaf, came back to Singapore from Jakarta to launch Costa Coffee. And then I got uh, connected with Four Fingers. So my entire career has been about brands and, and how brands thrive how they live and how they die. So that's what I want to weave a story to you about. Now, my story with Four Fingers kind of starts here. This is in April 2014. It is the spare bedroom in an apartment in the new owner of Four Fingers um, home at St. Regis. So Four Fingers went through a change of ownership. The previous owners who I worked under in 2013 had grown what I call a one outlet chain. So Four Fingers was basically a chain, but only one outlet. The one at Ion, you may have seen that, yeah? So my job was to scale up the business, but there was no money. So I left the business after six months and then helped the business through a change of ownership. And literally in April 2014, that was me sitting in VJ's spare bedroom at St. Regis, building up the business from scratch. Why do I say this? I say it because from the beginning, my vision for Four Fingers was very, very clear. I saw Four Fingers a bit like Red Bull versus Coca-Cola. Both are carbonated soft drinks, but the brands are hugely different, right? And I'm sure you will agree that Red Bull can do things that Coca-Cola can never do because they are a different brand in a different stage of its life cycle. So I saw Four Fingers as a brand that was one outlet chain, but with a huge potential because the brand could really shake up the category. Four Fingers against KFC. So I'll fast forward to April 2018. Do you all know what this is? You still use Facebook? <laughs> some do, some don't. Okay, so, so Facebook is a, is a useful media for certain things. And um, as I mentioned, when I started, or kind of restarted Four Fingers in, in uh, 2014, my vision was always and only to build a brand. Running chicken restaurants, hiring staff, buying and cooking chicken and so on is all part of my vision was to build a brand. That was the only thing I wanted to do. And lo and behold, we had 50,000 likes in April 2018, and we had almost 3,000 people who had taken the time to like or share or actually write comments. Now, here's the thing you've got to know about brands. Brands only exist in one place, and that's inside consumers. Everything else is, is printed on paper, it's logos, it's packaging, but brands only exist inside consumers. And what I knew was that we saw all these comments that we had set out to build a brand that we had achieved it because people actually bothered to write us really nice things on our Facebook page. Now, what does it take to build a brand? First of all, you've got to start with a big idea. Whether they are egg tarts or whether they are chocolate pies or whatever, start with a big idea and say how is what you are going to do going to change things for consumers. And make sure that there's something in it that makes it relevant, but also different from who your competitors uh, are. If you, who knows Tiger Woods? Pretty good at playing golf, right? I'll give you the choice. Unless you're very good at playing golf, if you're gonna go up against Tiger Woods, you wanna go play golfing, or you wanna do netball, or you wanna do triathlons. You choose something that he's not good at, right? For me, for Four Fingers, I said, I'm not going to do what KFC does. They do low price, fast speed, sort of medium quality. I said, I'll do medium price, much better quality, and I'll focus on creating a brand with an experience, okay? So, you need two ingredients to build a brand. We are in the food uh, area, so what are the two ingredients? 
first of all, you need to be consistent. And secondly, you need time. So what I mean is that set your own standards and make sure that you deliver them consistently to your consumers. If you do, over time, your brand will thrive because people will begin to expect certain things from you and see that you fulfill it, right? So coming back to building a brand rather than being product driven. Now, one of the brands that I've always aspired to, um, to become like is Walt Disney. So this, is, this actually is Walt Disney. It's a real guy. He, he um, was around sitting here with, with Mickey Mouse. So Disney is one of the most valuable brands in the world. Disney is known for the Disney magic. But Disney in their own words say that there's nothing magic about Disney. All they do is intentionally overmanage certain parts of the customer journey that other brands overlook. Okay? So who has been to uh, Disneyland, Disney's theme park? Quite a few, right? Was it awesome or mediocre? Maybe expensive, but nice, right? <laughs> Did you know that they have 1,483 touch points that they are actively using to create your memories from Disneyland? Starting with the first sign you might see in the airport until you've been through the park the whole day and you say, now, I really, I, I can't manage it anymore. I'm so tired, it's been amazing, right? They have almost 1,500 touch points that they actively use to create that brand journey for you, the Disney magic or the brand experience. So I said brands many times in the last five minutes and, and, and what I really believe in is that brands are great at creating value. So let's take Four Fingers as an example of a chicken brand versus a brand that could be KFC. When KFC rents space, they pay the same as Four Fingers, more or less. When they hire staff, they pay the same as Four Fingers. And when they buy chicken, they pay the same per kilo. Actually, they pay a little bit less because they're bigger. They spend a little bit less on staff because they're cheapskates. And they get better leases because they're bigger, right? But my point is, for the same cost of input, raw material, labor and rent, which is most of the cost in F&B, the value of the output for Four Fingers and a brand like KFC is hugely different. If you take KFC's average check, it's about $8. Four Fingers is about $16. But the costs are the same. So brands create value because they make people willing to spend more money for what you give them. Brands are also great at capturing and defending market share because brands endure and brands survive times of trouble and times of, of hardship. And brands uh, make it, it possible for you to build a business that has momentum because brands exist inside consumers, not just inside a mall or on an on a online shopping platform. Okay? Now, um, just before I pass on to, I hope, all your exciting questions, I have to tell you, I enjoyed things like this very, very much because I've been in Singapore for 19, since 1999. I've really enjoyed staying here. And every time I have a chance to kind of pay that forward, I'll gladly take it. So nights like this, I really, really enjoy. So please, any questions you have, feel free to ask. This is an amazing book that's written in the 1980s. I'm sorry. We had actually, we did have color print back then, okay? <laughs> But basically, this chap here is a former charter company executive. So basically, you can buy a charter trip to, let's say, the Maldives, and then that company will book flights um, for you and take care of the whole thing. SAS, Scandinavian Airlines, was a state-owned airline in Northern Europe, in Scandinavia, that was about to go bust for many years in a row. And eventually, they said, we've got to try with someone from outside the industry. We need some fresh ideas. Let's get someone who doesn't know anything about airlines. So they brought in Jan Carlson. And Jan Carlson basically got all the management staff into one big aircraft hangar. He took one of those jetways you use to board the aircraft. He got up and says, hi, I am Jan Carlson. He has a Swedish accent. I'm Jan Carlson. I'm your new CEO. And I don't know anything about running an airline but I'm sure you do. So I hope I'll hear from you. So what he said was, you are the guys who have all the answers. I can help you make the decisions, but it's gonna come from you. That was the first thing he did. Second thing was that he said, what are all the moments when our customers are in touch with our business? Booking a ticket, boarding an aircraft, checking into a hotel and so on. And just like Disney, he designed 
a customer journey that built the brand around actively using people to create moments of truth. So with that, I'll wrap up my sort of very brand focused little talk about, about how Four Fingers got started, how we built a, sort of a, we say a world famous brand, at least in Singapore, right? We're world famous in Singapore. And how I would suggest that you also think about what are some of the things that will be creating value for you, whether you do a food business or fashion business or any other kind of business that you go into in the B2C space. And if you have any questions that you don't want to ask right now, please email me. I'd be very happy to hear from you. Thank you. Yep, so at this point in time, we'd like to open the floor to any questions. If you have any questions, just raise your hand. I'll bring the mic over. Uh, you started with one outlet for Four Fingers. So in your opinion, does it worthwhile to buy franchise to get into a food business? So the question was, is franchising the right strategy forward? So when you do a franchise, you pay someone who has a business system for the right to use their business system. The benefit is that you mitigate any risk you have of starting new business of yourself. The downside is that it's gonna cost you, right? Anywhere from four to seven percent of your revenue. So I would answer by saying, how risk averse are you? Because if you want a safe bet, it's probably better to take a franchise because it's a proven and tried system. But if you say, I would like to go a little bit further because it gives me greater profitability because I'm not paying a royalty to someone else, then accept that risk and go for it. I think the fundamental question in Singapore today is how saturated is the market with outlets in general, whether they are franchise or, or own stores? Because what you always want is a balance between demand and supply. And Singapore, I have to caution you, Singapore has a steady growth in number of outlets. Right now about 6,700 outlets in Singapore. And there's a structural oversupply of eateries so there's a, there's a thinning of the demand for eateries versus Hong Kong and South Korea and so on. So I think to answer your question, it's a matter of how, how much appetite do you have for risk? Franchise gives you a safe bet, it gives you support, you can tap into a support network, you can tap into marketing ideas and so on, but you end up paying four to 7% of your profit in royalties. My name is Elizabeth Su. I'm teaching here as an adjunct faculty. Um, what is the value of the brand Four Fingers for you? And the second question is, what was the most painful challenge you faced when growing Four Fingers? And how did you respond to that? <laughs> okay, so what is the value of the brand? So, so basically, the, a way to assess the value of a brand is to say, if all Four Fingers doors burn down tomorrow, and all that I have left as a shareholder in the business is the rights to the brand, how much money can I borrow in the bank? All right. So they will say, all right, it's 10 million, whatever it is. I, I, I don't know. But what I can say is that as you grow a business, if you grow the brand, brands are scalable in a way that restaurants aren't. Because restaurants is a matter of securing a lease, building a store, finding raw materials, hiring staff, where brands are infinitely scalable, which is, again, brands create value. Um, so absolute value of the business, I, I can't tell you, but I think for a brand like that, which is very consumer driven, which is all about brand experience, um, I think it's quite high. But of course, I'm biased. Now, second question was uh, difficult times. So my story with Four Fingers is actually extremely long. And it involves four police reports. It involves um, receiverships. It re involves court hearings. It involves mediation and many other things that I went through because I was decided not to take no for an answer. So here's what happened. February 2013, I was hired by the previous owners. They turned out to be dishonest. Um, in order to raise funding for the business, they even asked me for a loan that they wanted to use to repay someone else. Right, I go, hang on a second, this is not quite right. Eventually, I actually got fired because they wanted me to sign documents that I considered to be a breach of my, what is called fiduciary duties. So if you are director of a company, you have a duty to the law of the country to make sure the, comp the company is run well. This wasn't. So they got rid of me. And the next day, the company went into receivership because a secured creditor said, they're trying to screw me too, so I'll follow the way of the law. 
And then followed around two years of uncertainty, of working without getting paid, working purely on oxygen and water, um, of I said, receiverships, court processes, all these different things. Many of my friends, I'm going to make this a little bit personal, many of my friends says, how did you possibly withstand the pressures, right? You have a family, you have things to care of, all this you went through. And I said, for me, it was a moment when I decided that it was a great business with some great people, but it was in the wrong ownership. So I said, I will be the one who tries to help the business through this change of ownership so we can grow it. Now, as an entrepreneur, I shared with, um, with the gentleman here that as an entrepreneur, you need to be a little bit of a masochist because you will be facing a lot of adversity and a lot of rejection and a lot of failures and so on. You have to find motivation in that. And if you do, you can overcome things that you normally would be able to do. So my advice maybe as entrepreneurs is to say, be prepared and actually enjoy it a little bit because whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Yep. Hi, and thank you so much for sharing today. Um, my name is Stan. One question that I have, if you would use one sentence, how would you define a brand? Um, when we were strategizing about what, what was the essence of the brand, um, we were looking in many different ways and many different angles and so on. So I believe that if a company can figure out why it does what it does, it has a different kind of strength than if you know what you do or how you do it, right? If you know the why you do what you do, then you have a sense of purpose and a sense of vision. So what happened was that we sat down and we said, and I was always very, I never liked vision and vision. I'm very sorry, but I, I just find it very boring and no one cares, right? It's a nice poster in a boardroom, but it does make a difference. What I like about it is what I call the big idea. So if you look at Apple, their link between Apple as a company and consumers as human beings is their big idea. And we said, what's our big idea at Four Fingers? And how can we use that to drive our people, our experience, and our food? So we were searching high and low for like, this is important stuff, right? And what we saw was um, a hiring poster from 29 that said, join the resistance. So that's kind of a big idea. It means that there is a resistance. It doesn't mean that we are the resistance, but we are definitely part of it, right? So our internal rallying cry became join the resistance because we said that gives us a platform for, for disruption, for being a bit rebellious, for being a bit naughty, a bit subversive. That's kind of our big idea. And then we said join the resistance is about disruption. Now how do we then make that aspirational theme an operational theme? So how does it drive how we build our stores, who we hire, what kind of food we cook, and so on. So in a nutshell, Join the Resistance became our internal, our internal rallying cry. Who has aspirations to go into FMB? Good. No one. <laughs> it is an interesting business because um, it's great to have passion. But you have to wear different kind of lenses when you look at an idea and in a business, right? So if you uh, have ambitions to make the world's best, I don't know, chocolate tarts, right? That's a beautiful thing. But understanding the economics of producing chocolate tarts, where's your money going to be made from? Who are going to be your customers? What will be the cost structure you have and so on? That's where if you don't know how to do it yourself, find a mentor. You find someone you can get advice from because you can't be good at everything. And as you begin to grow your business, you will need to find people who know skills that you don't know yourself, because that's the way that you build a, a proper team. So, so think about wearing different lenses, different hats when you look at your idea and say, yeah, there is the passion needed to sort of do the world's best something, but there's also the economic realities of paying rent every single month, of hiring staff for half staff that doesn't show up, which happens often too. Uh, so be prepared for all those things that are the the, the reality is of running um, a food business. So, lady over here. Yeah. Hi, thank you for sharing. Um, just out of curiosity, what made you um, make, make the switch from like um, the different brands? Because like Disney to FMB is a very big uh, jump. So I'm just curious, like what made you make the switch? So, uh, so my switch from Disney actually happened by chance because uh, I worked for Disney. Uh, there was something called the Soviet Union back in the day, yeah? And when that collapsed, mainly consumer brands moved in, and I was working for a Disney publisher. 
So I moved to Prague. I lived there from 92 to 95, basically in what I call the Wild West when the countries were emerging from a planned economy to a market economy, very interesting transition phase. So I got some experience in working with the unique problems of infrastructure, you know, getting a, honestly a phone call, right? We used to try to, to do the, the dial-up modems, 56 KB going, da, 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 da. that was kind of to send an email, right? So I got experience in working in countries with kind of hardship infrastructures. So McDonald's was expanding into Eastern Europe also. And they said, we can train someone on the marketing skills, but we need someone who understands the idiosyncrasies of working in a, in a former communist country. So they hired me and gave me all the training. And that's kind of when I, when I saw that brands are kind of universally applicable. Consumer products, so Disney books, magazines, hamburgers, and, and so on. So it was actually pure coincidence. Um, you are in, you were introduced as the ex CEO. So, what made you decide to leave Four Fingers, and where are you going from here? So, uh, so, so Four Fingers is owned uh, majority share by uh, a former M and A guy, and his plan was always to do what is called an aggregation. So, when you when you make money with companies as an investor, you either do what is called a pure play, which means there is one company, one business, or you aggregate companies to consolidate, to get cost saving, and so on. So um, the owner wanted to go out and buy other companies that I thought strategically would not add value to Four Fingers. Maybe some of you saw last week that Four Fingers has bought half of a Mexican chain in, in Australia. Well, you saw the news, but that was in the news last week. And that was uh, one of the acts that I said strategically, I think, is going to divert and distract attention from the Four Fingers business, which is a very good pure play. So I said, all right, this, he's the, the majority shareholder, so I'll let him have the keys and I'll move on. Um, I was looking into different things and, and I was tapped on the shoulder by um, a chap who runs a private equity fund because he believes that my operational experience can be put to greater use now in terms of not just running companies, but actually looking at companies structurally and seeing whether you can improve them from the point of view of, of revenue and, and profits. So I'm taking a bit of a leap of faith going into private equity. I will still retain my entrepreneurial mindset because I, I think it, it's something that you're much more born with than the skill you actually acquire. I think it's a bit of a personality that you, at least if you don't have it, you kind of develop it over time. So I'm quite excited about that also. Who wants to be an entrepreneur? One, why? That's a very good question, actually. Because I believe that uh, being an entrepreneur, this is the only way how I can reach my full potential. Yeah. That's all. Okay. Nice. Anyone else? Yeah. Any questions? I mean, normally I always get asked, why four fingers, right? That's the obvious question. Do you want to know? Okay, so there were four original founders, so one finger per founder. But they also said that the chicken foot has four fingers, and when you eat fried chicken, you use four fingers. So that's the story about that. Yeah. I'm uh, year one in social science um, at SMU. So I just have a question that I find um, the experiences that you have in more than 20 years of a career, um, there are many coincidental kinds of work experience that you had. But in all these work experiences that you had, um, I'm sure that uh, I'm, there were probably goals that you set for yourself and probably until today you still have goals that you have not met. So how far are you in achieving the goals that you have set for yourself, yeah? It's a very good question. Um, so if I look at, at, at the career of many of my schoolmates, so, you know, via this thing called Facebook, I connected with some old school friends I hadn't seen since before some of you were born. One is a taxi driver, he's very happy as a taxi driver. One is still a nurse, and, and they're all very happy with doing what they're doing. And they said, so what have you done since we saw you 35 years ago? So, well, I kind of run a chicken chain. But 
the difference is that I, I was given probably the same choices as they were, but they chose the more homebound choice, where I had more of, let me see if I can get out of here and do something. So in 1992, I had my first job outside of Denmark. I moved from Copenhagen to Czechoslovakia. And from then on, I never looked back. And I was very hungry for, for adventure and for taking risks. So I, I suppose I quite like to go where there's a green field and nothing to be built up. I do that and I kind of hand the keys on. But that's again something where the more we know ourselves in terms of how we are as human beings, the better we're able to align also our career with what is the right choice for us. Kofu and I spoke uh, just before we started about sort of what does it take to be an entrepreneur. I, I actually think entrepreneurship is something you can learn, but being an entrepreneur is something that you kind of have. I don't see myself as someone who does work only in an entrepreneurial way. Everything I do sets out to be the best I can be, whether I row, I'm, I'm actually the national champion in rowing in Singapore 2004. Um, whether I'm a father, whether I am, whatever I do, I always like to be very competitive. Right? Um, so I believe that sort of knowing who you are from the inside is relevant to many things, not just to work. And for me, when does it start? Probably when I take my, take my last breath, because I think the quality of life for me is about experiences. And it's about sort of taking my last breath saying, wow, that was a life well lived. And I care less about material wealth. I care much more about health, friends, friendships, family and about being intellectually stimulated. That to me is very important. So as long as there's something there, I will be active. Yeah. Hello, I'm, I'm Zeng Wei. And uh, my question is, um, uh, what are the second most important thing that you see that is crucial to the success of um, a FMB um, chain like Left Four Fingers? other than brand value? Uh, it's a very good question. And, and I, I think um, discipline is very important, right? So as I mentioned, that brands are built on consistency, but that's not something that happens by itself. If you are just you in your shop doing tarts, then you can be consistent. But the moment that you add more people, more outlets, more countries, what you need is to make sure that, that never is one customer let down in any store in any country around the world. Because this day and age, news can travel very, very fast. And one consumer can tear down all the hard work you put into building a brand. So one of the things I also do is I also like private aviation. And one of the things I learned from private aviation is that pilots like to fix things on the ground. Right? We really do. We don't like to take off and kind of suka suka see how. Okay? We like to make sure that we go through our checklist, that we have done our planning, and we have our contingencies because it means if something goes wrong, the plan is ready. Okay? So I've applied that kind of procedural thinking to business and saying, what are the systems, processes, SOPs, KPIs that I can use to make sure that every single transaction that we do at Four Fingers is done as good as it can? Four Fingers does really only two things. On a micro level, we serve one customer, and that's one microcycle we figure out how to run. And on a macro level, we run one store. The rest is only scaling up. Now, you can't scale up without systems, processes, and discipline. And that, to me, is the institutionalization of your big idea, right? So that's sort of what drives the brand, is the foundation in sort of a bit of an obsession with, with good systems and processes. Um, as an entrepreneur, what kind of networks do you see critical to you know, your business? What kind of networks should entrepreneurs get into or, you know, what have you got into? So network. So uh, I think guan xi is the Mandarin word, right? So I, I love going out and doing things like this and, and network and name cards and so on is really important. And I, I do take time from time to time to go through my endless stacks of name cards and reach out to people that can be of some either use to me or I can be some use to them. Um, I think... You know, being an entrepreneur requires many different skills and you can't be good at everything yourself. But, but the networking to me is also the marketing of your idea. And it's about getting in front of the right people, whether they are VCs or PE funds or, as you say, the, the first source of funding is the three Fs. It's friends, 
families and fools, right? So that's kind of the first round of fundraising. The second round is what you call pre-IPO, so that'll be institutional investors, and third, typically, is IPOs or a trade sale. So to me, sort of being, being good at, at going out and, and, and talking up excitement about what you're doing. VCs always look for the people. Yeah, they'll see you need $100 million, but do they believe in the people that are asking for $100 million? And that's where, if you're not very confident doing that, then maybe have a business partner that can, that can do it for you because the hurdle there clearly for VCs is do they believe in the team that are proposing an idea? Yeah, over there. So when building a brand, um, what's your ratio of spend of digital to say outdoor? Uh, that's a very good question. So, so basically, I think what's important to start by asking is who are you trying to reach? So if you're reaching my target audience, you need completely different media than your target audience so because you're just using different media. Um, typically, a marketing budget is somewhere between 3 to 6% of your revenue. And then typically, around two-thirds of that goes into media. Now, then the question, of course, is what kind of media do you buy? That needs to be seen in relation to who you're trying to reach, your social media, outdoor, and so on. So there's, there's, no, there's no one answer for that. It depends on the brand and who you're trying to reach. But what's very important is that you, you're mindful of the fact that if you can't get to a certain kind of spending, better not do it. Because we are receiving hundreds of marketing messages every single day. All right? And if you can't cut through the clutter, that money is wasted. So I'll just say, if you do something, do it full steam. Otherwise, do something else you can better afford. So on hindsight, is anything you have done differently at more videos? Uh, um, <laughs> done differently. Um, I think probably a couple of things. Yeah. So, so when we said, let's grow this business, we said, what are the criteria for selecting new markets for us? So we said there are three criteria. We like to work in countries where there is the rule of law. Not that we plan to sue people, but if we have to, nice to know that the courts are clean. Right? Secondly, we like to work in countries where there is a strong and stable currency that is a multiplier, not a divider. Right, so if we're selling in rupees or in pesos, that's a divider. If you're selling US dollars or in euros, that's a multiplier. And thirdly, we said, let's look for markets where we have a substantial base of consumers who are disenfranchised with the old entrenched brands. If you learn about marketing, you have U and A, right? So usage and attitude. So what you want to see as a brand owner is that your brand attitude is at least as favorable as your brand usage. Right? That means that consumers like you and they use you. Now, these three criteria are quite high hurdles, right? They kind of canceled out most of Southeast Asia. So in hindsight, I would have said we should have gone much more for markets like Philippines, Thailand, and Indonesia, because even though they don't meet all the three, they meet at least one or two of them. So we could have grown quicker in these markets if we hadn't set our own threshold so high. So that may be one thing I would say. Could have done a bit differently, but of course there were benefits of not doing it, which was that our growth in Singapore was was very robust. Yeah, just a random question. So, what is one thing that you would say that you would like to remember for life? What uh, I would like to be remembered for? Uh, no, the, what you you would like to remember for life? Um, I, I suppose uh, it has to be my kids. Right. So I'm not talking about a businessman, I was saying that when you have kids, you realize that you knew nothing about life up until then, honestly. Especially you don't know fear until you have kids. When you have kids, you really know fear. Okay? <laughs> them running in front of a car or whatever. Um, but I suppose also that, that if, if you can sort of leave your mark in, in, in a way on people by having been helpful or being supportive or whatever, that's kind of a nice thing. So yeah, something like that. I'm not ambitious to say I built an empire and so on. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm motivated by different things. I, I like intellectual challenge. I like to be helpful. But whether or not I can end up saying I'm sort of mini Steve Jobs, not really the currency I use to measure happiness in. Uh, if there are no more questions, um, we'd like to thank Mr. Steve uh, Pugat for his sharing and we'll go on with our speed pitching section. Okay. Thank you thank so you. much.